that time again, that time when we meander accidentally into the hallowed halls of justice, on accident of course, to visit with Catherine Hartley from the Pacific Justice Institute. I'm joined by Greg and Ken, and I'm your host, Christopher Antone, and this is three pastors walk into a bar, or a courthouse as it were. Question mark the other it? bar, the legal bar. <laughs> the legal bar. I think that's a quite a different bar. Yes. From where we've been. Although there might be just as much drinking that goes on there. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Catherine, thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me today. Oh, man, our pleasure. We really appreciate it and uh, hope to learn a little bit more about the Pacific Justice Institute here today. Um, from the website, your mission statement uh, reads like this. As a legal nonprofit, our mission is to defend without charge, the religious freedoms, parental rights, and other civil liberties of people who cannot defend themselves. We work to diligent or we work diligently to provide our clients with dedicated, exceptional legal support, completely funded by our generous supporters. That's pretty awesome. Um, you, it, it reminds me uh, a lot of what uh, the... Uh, uh, what's the name of that group Which that we one? support? Not the CLA. Uh, that does remind yeah. me of the CLA a little bit, but <laughs> ADF. Well, uh, ADF, the ADF Alliance, Alliance Defending, Defending Freedom. Freedom. So you guys are pretty similar to that in the way that you're funded, except for you guys take on more like personal cases. Is that kind of what I'm thinking? Not just like church stuff. That's right. Um, ADF is a, is a great group. And yes, we are similar in a lot of ways. I think probably the biggest difference is that we established local offices mm -hmm. around the country and we have attorneys specifically that head up those offices and are local to the people who need help in, mm -hmm. in the areas that we operate under. Um, we're not necessarily out there just looking for big cases to get to right. the Supreme Court, although that is also important, so that's not a bad thing. Um, but our philosophy is more so to um, take any and every case for anyone who needs us, um, whether it's a big, big case or a very small case. Right, right. That's awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about Catherine. Who is Catherine? Who, who's the person we're talking to right now? <laughs> um, I have kind of an interesting background. So I started in healthcare, actually, and I was a nurse for a number of years. And I actually went to law school specifically to go into healthcare law. And I did do that for a while. And I actually saw within healthcare a lot of deterioration of liberties just within healthcare. I started to see that it was getting worse and worse. I think COVID hit, and that really uh, highlighted a lot of the issues going on there. Right. And so that kind of very slowly brought me into this type of work and just seeing rapidly our freedoms going away yeah it seems like it, it now are the um so you were going through law school before covid hit absolutely yes uh, definitely. Obviously, yeah. okay, so when covid hit that kind of just accelerated your timeline substantially to get out of health care and to get into something w was definitely. there a driver to get out of health care for you there really wasn't at first no mm -hmm. um i just i wanted to be legal help you know mm -hmm. for other health care workers like myself I saw that that was a need and wanted to do that. Um, and then, yeah, slowly but surely focused only on law because I saw that was actually the bigger need in that area. And then COVID hit and it was, as you know, <laughs> yeah, what, <laughs> major. What, what type of things were you experiencing when you say you were defending uh, healthcare workers? What was, what was going on that made you realize, hey, we need to 
step in here and help out? Good question. A lot of what I did was defend healthcare workers against state boards. So they would have dis- if they had a disciplinary action against them by the state board, so the state medical board, the state nursing board, et cetera. Um, and I just saw them trying to very tightly control decision making of healthcare providers. And, and that's just what everything has gone to. It's, it's extremely corporate now. The decisions are being taken away from individual providers who have individual education and individual experience, right? Mm-hmm. That's why we choose to, you know, pick our right. own healthcare providers. So uh, <clears throat> initially it wasn't necessarily religion based, faith based. It could be. In, in some mm-hmm. cases it, it certainly was. You know, you must, this is the protocol and you mm-hmm. have to follow it. Doesn't matter what you believe, doesn't matter you know, what the patient wants even. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I start, you know, that kind of started me kind of thinking down this road and then it just accelerated from there. Okay. Yeah. That, it, that's a, that's a tough area. The, the, the whole healthcare issue. I don't want to get sidetracked on a, on a conversation about healthcare, but, um, but the, there is a big conversation to be had there, not only with the corporatization of healthcare, but, with uh, how these folks that are in healthcare are actually going to be able to continue to do the services that they do um, with the continued not only overreach of government, Mm -hmm. which in my assessment, now I'm not an expert on healthcare, but it seems to me that administrators have taken on the role of healthcare as opposed to doctors and nurses. Absolutely. Yes. Um, yeah. And yes. the reason that that has happened is because of the massive bureaucracy of the federal government for, for a, for a large part. Correct. Mm-hmm. You're yeah. right. Uh, so how do you, how do you think you begin to re- recover from that? Is it even possible? <laughs> <laughs> is that a thing? Uh, that's scary that she laughed at that. <laughs> <laughs> There aren't and enough lawyers laughed. in the world. <laughs> and she laughed really quickly, too. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> like what the question nuts? came out, and she was like instantly, <laughs> talk, uh, well. Yeah, don't know that me. we can go back. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think people are, are, are genuinely concerned, you know. I mean, with, uh, like, to say, for instance, like with the, the whole forgiving of the student loan debt thing that's happening. A lot of people are extremely opposed to that. Um, you know, but I, I, and, and I am too, to a degree, I, I feel like if you're going to forgive all that student loan debt, then you probably just need to get out of the business entirely and let capitalism do its work. Right. Um, do you think that that could happen for the healthcare industry? Do you think if, if the federal government were just to step out, do you think it would self-correct over time? I do. I do. The question is, is that ever going to happen realistically? Right. Um, as far as I can see right now, no, certainly anything can happen. Right. Um, I, but I think it's just snowballing the wrong direction, mm-hmm. and it would take a lot to to get that corrected. So yeah. not unfortunately. Under the current leadership for sure. Definitely not under the current leadership. More more entitlement, more you know, more federal oversight, mm-hmm. yeah. more free health care. Yeah, you, that's kind of the direction that a lot of people want to go. And unfortunately, being in a small community like we are here in Athol. Um, a lot of times we feel at the mercy of large metropolises Definitely. Um, like Boise. And, you know, I, I know I have friends that live in Oregon. In fact, we've had a, a family that just moved here from Oregon. Mm-hmm. And the reason that they moved here was because they were tired of their voice not meaning anything. Because basically Portland to- said, told everybody in the state what you're going to do. Um, and so I think a lot of smaller communities are feeling that pinch mm-hmm. a little bit. So it's nice to have some allies. It mm-hmm. really is. Mm-hmm. And like you were saying, we've got some really great legislatures here. Um, and they really do a fine job. Uh, so it's nice to have some other groups involved mm-hmm. that can that can help out with that. Because, quite frankly, we're going to need it, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we are really fortunate, especially... In North Idaho, we have a lot of great state representatives Mm -hmm. that are really going to bat for us. And, um, you know, they're up against a lot from the contingency from Boise, no doubt. Yeah, sure. But they are 
um, at least unified with each other and they are unafraid from yeah. what I can tell mm -hmm. to go after it and they're going to be persistent and that's all we can ask for. Right. <laughs> was, there, right. Was, was there a reason that you, uh, the Institute decided to put somebody in Idaho? It's a great question. I get that question a lot and yeah, it, it they were getting a lot more requests for help from Idaho mm -hmm. and said, we really need an Idaho based attorney um, to handle all of this. So were you involved at all with the Kellogg dust up over there with the, the senior <laughs> class? And the Definitely aware of all that. Can't yeah. can't fully disclose okay. um, a lot there at this time. But wait, there's nor more. Deny. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's way more of a confirmation than you think that it is probably. Yeah. Unfortunately. But yes, that was obviously in national news, and that was um, really unfortunate incident. Mm -hmm. yeah. That happened for a lot of different people. There were a lot of ripple effects from that incident. And it's, I, th I think it was a shock to a lot of people because people looked at that and said, this is happening in small town Idaho. Therefore, it's got to be happening everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it's and mainly the school system. It's, exactly. It's inundated with, uh, with postmodernist thinking. Yes. Um, and uh, y these kids are getting this education from their colleges and, Somebody was asking me the other day, it's like, why are we seeing all this now? And, and I'm just thinking, well, probably because everybody who is coming into power right now all went to school at the same time at the same schools. Right. Uh, and so now they're kind of getting to a place where, okay, now everything that we taught in school is going to really come out now. The indoctrination right. is finally taking place. To a degree. Yeah. You know, I, I, I really, maybe I'm being uh, awfully hopeful here, but I really think that for the large part, um, ordinary people are just rejecting it all yeah. the way around. Mm -hmm. So for our listeners that. who who haven't been following the national news and what happened in Kellogg, can you kind of give us a, a legal analysis of the basics of what happened there and what the issues are? Sure. Um, there was a high school student at Kellogg High School, um, small town, about 2,000 people, who um, was a se graduating senior, and they had a school assembly where they the seniors were allowed to get up and give advice to the underclassmen before they left the school. And one student, among other things, said that boys are boys, girls are girls, and there's no in between. And he how controversial, <laughs> yeah. right? Huh? And it's a biological fact, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. So strange. Science. But the school came down very, very hard on that student, um, was suspended, wasn't allowed to participate in his high school graduation. Um, you know, there were some other ripple effects that happened after that. Um, but it was very shocking, you know. And, and the, the biggest problem from a legal standpoint is obviously this is a free speech issue, but it's, it's also just incredibly biased. You know, if he had said something representing the opposite view mm -hmm. on that issue, would this have happened? You know, he, he obviously we don't know for sure, but certainly the guess is they would have said nothing about it. Student wouldn't have been punished. So that is kind of the crux of our First Amendment. It, the First Amendment is not biased. You can't discriminate speech based on a specific viewpoint. Whether you like it or not. Whether you like it or not, whether you think it offends you or not, you know, the First Amendment doesn't say you have free speech unless it's offensive. Yeah. So, you know, when you discriminate based on a specific viewpoint, that immediately turns into a First Amendment problem. And that's really what they did. So it, it's more about the bias and as it is. I mean, the First Amendment is tied into it, but it's more about the bias that they utilized potentially to uh, to to. to to punish him because any other viewpoint would have been fine except for that one. Exactly. And there's, you know, there's evidence that the school was allowing the other viewpoint. There were pride flags. There were, you know, there was speech reflecting that viewpoint. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so you can't allow one viewpoint on a topic and not allow the other viewpoint on a topic. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's pretty insane. Mm -hmm. So, what are some of the like larger things that we're looking at dealing at 
with in our community. So, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. we can focus out a a little bit broader because there are some questions that I have about some bigger things. Mm -hmm. But just in our communities, what are some of the things that we should be looking out for as far as what's coming down the pipeline? What should we be reading up on, studying, researching? Great question. Um, one thing we're seeing a lot of that that somewhat ties into the Kellogg situation is there's there's a massive attempt to silence biblical viewpoints. It whether that's in the workplace, obviously in schools, um, in some cases on the street corner. What you know, what people are retirement shouting at homes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> that was, that was it's truly happening. Yeah, yeah, everywhere. You you go you visit those a lot. <laughs> I'm looking into them. Yeah, personal experience. <laughs> Actually, it was a video on their website that was quite interesting to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking into them. <laughs> Sorry, Catherine. Go that's ahead. Okay. <laughs> continue. Continue. So I think it's important for people to know that's happening. Christians need to be aware that, you know, biblical views are truly being silenced, you know, and one one great example other than, you know, the one we just described happening in the school setting is workplaces are have you know creating these policies that require all employees you know for example to use certain pronouns you know Mm -hmm. feed into that and 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 affirm you know what someone wants to call themselves and and if you don't comply with that you can be disciplined as an employee and you can it's considered workplace harassment so this is popping up a lot even even here locally and in our state And I think uh, it's important for people to know what their rights are in that setting. And it's, we still have, (laughs) still, I say, you know, hopefully that remains that way. We still have really great federal and state laws that protect each person's right to live out their faith, you know, whether that's at work or not. So I'm sorry, but if, if you are at a job and your job says that, we have a policy that you must honor a person's individual pronouns. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are your responsibilities with that? I mean, what can you and can you not do? Mm-hmm. So if the, the main law that governs that, is, that includes private employers as well as government employers is Title VII, you know, which is a federal law. And you have a right to have your religious belief accommodated. Okay, so as Christians, we believe men are men, women are women. Calling someone something else would violate our our sincerely held beliefs. Okay, so you have a right to go to your employer and say, I am I would like a religious accommodation because this is something that I cannot do based on my faith. And they are responsible to try to accommodate you. So it, it's it, it's up to us, the offended party, that, yep. to go and make it right, so to speak. Exactly. And so that's a lot of what we, you know, we try to do, our group, is to educate people on their own rights. Because certainly, you yeah. know, you wouldn't, a lot of people wouldn't know that they have, they have a right to re- request a mm-hmm. religious accommodation. And, and so that's the kind of thing we like to get out there, especially with this issue in particular, this is happening everywhere. And this is a very common problem. And if they chose not to accommodate you, then that's when you would need to look up a lawyer. Correct. Yeah. Yes. And, and we even help people write, you know, their requests. You know, we kind of generally know what to put in a religious accommodation request. And so we're happy to help, you know, folks with that as well. Right. Um, and just guide them through that process. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know that that happens here in certain places. Not... Not in all of the companies that we have here, but I know that we do have a large company here that um, we've had some kids in our church that have worked there, Mm -hmm. um, and they have uh, had complaints written up about them because Mm -hmm. they refuse to use a person's specific pronoun or didn't even want to talk about pronouns. We have one person that goes here that they were telling me that they they were having a conversation in one of the places at the, at the job place about pronouns. And they asked him, what do you think about pronouns? And he was like, I don't want to talk about pronouns. I just want to do my job. Um, right. And he got, he got disciplined for that. 
Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, and when I say disciplined, he got called into the office and there was a write up and, mm -hmm. you know, and then that kind of thing. And uh, so it is happening right here in our community. Yeah. Yes. Would, would Pacific get involved in something seemingly as simple as that? Absolutely. Oh, yes. Okay. That's exactly what we're here for. Okay. And, you know, in all the areas where we operate, you know, uh, religious freedom, you know, parental rights related to schools, um, a lot of what we do is educate, you know, so that each individual knows what they what they can and can't do, what their rights are, and then obviously when to call us if it's mm -hmm. not working out. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's definitely a huge part of what we like to do. So it, it, it that's what you guys do. <clears throat> do we need to do more of that so that the quote unquote world, the rest of the world knows that, <laughs> hey, we're here and we're going to stand up for ourselves? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, and it's, again, the other setting where this is very true is in the school setting. When parents mm -hmm. know what their rights are, what their child's as a student's rights are, it's very powerful. You know, I think when parents step back, they have no idea what they can and can't do. They get afraid. That's when the school can kind of make a run for it and do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And, you know, parents have a lot of rights, especially in our state. You know, parental, yeah. we have really strong parental rights laws. Mm -hmm. We're hoping to continue to improve upon them. But comparatively, we still have great laws here. Right. And parents need to know about that. So similarly with employee-employer relationships, mm -hmm. um, employees have certain rights. Employers have certain rights as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Christian employer... Mm -hmm. That's another topic, but yeah. go ahead. Which we have several here. Mm -hmm. Do is there a line like going back to the school mm -hmm. for for kids? Mm -hmm. Is there a line that you cross at some point for being too political about a subject in any given bias? I mean, is there a is there a policy that a school can write that says, "Look, we're not doing any of this stuff. We're just coming here to educate. We're not going to have any kind of like T-shirts, whether it's pride or whether it's anti-pride or whatever." Mm -hmm. Right. Is that a, a policy that a school could write? And would that be crossing a line? And how does that relate to like First Amendment rights? Uh, let me just preface it. Public, you're talking public, public school. Public school. Yeah, public school. That's a great question. So, yes, a school can do that as long as they are even handed. So, again, they can't say, oh, we don't want to hear conservative opinions about anything. Right. But we're going to allow the other viewpoint. So, yes, a school can write a policy and say, you know, we're not talking about gender at all we're, we're you know that that's not a topic we're done we're yeah. talking about yeah. at school you can talk to your parents about that you can talk to your church about that um so they absolutely can make those policies as long as they are even-handed with it and not allowing one viewpoint and not allowing the opposite viewpoint yeah it seems to me like if i were a school administrator that's exactly what i would do Yes, and if there, I, are, and there are schools a, doing that. If I were a public school administrator, yeah. I would just be like, guys, we're done. Yeah. We're not doing any more politics here. You're mm -hmm. going to come here. We're going to learn mm -hmm. math. We're going to yep. learn English. Yep. We're going to learn. We're, we're gonna learn. That's what we're going to do. We're not right. going to talk about different worldview philosophies and politics and things like that, except for right. in your civics class, and it's going to be educational only. Right. And there um, are districts doing that, that actually, and that you know they have great – people on the school board who are willing to write those policies and pass those mm -hmm. policies. And that is, you You're know, talking not Idaho. Absolutely. Yeah. Our, our area, okay. North Idaho, there are some districts that are, what districts would you identify as being some of the best conservative districts? Lakeland is, is great. They have a good superintendent, a good board. They, yep. they have policies like we're talking about. They're really trying to make it only an educational um, yeah, setting. Right. We're big fans of Lisa and her staff here. Yeah, yes. exactly. So you, you're already aware of that. Yeah. So they, so it, uh, that also shows the power that a school board can have and those elections are important and, p and parents need to be aware of who's on yeah. the school board, who the superintendent is, and if it's not going well, make some changes there. Yeah, you know one, one really good thing that happened at Lakeland School District here recently that we were involved with is there they did a thing where you could your church could purchase uh in god we trust mm -hmm. plaques mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they have put those mm -hmm. all over the dang place uh -huh. yeah. yeah they're everywhere mm -hmm. um cool. i think we we bought like what three three, three of yeah. them mm -hmm. yeah yeah 
We got a thank you note from one of the. She called me. Oh, did she? Yeah, Lisa called me. Um, But uh, you know, I that people in our district, Mm -hmm. um, Lisa gets a lot of bashing in our district because of the levies and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And and people get bent out of shape about levies, and understandably so. I I agree. It's it's a it's a it's a right pain, but um, but people need to hear this kind of stuff that you know uh, as far as districts are concerned lakeland has some of the most vigilant conservative mm-hmm. leaders that of any district that we have they are trying i mean mm-hmm. it, you know i can i can definitely say they're really trying to clean it up keep it straightforward educational which is their job yeah mm-hmm. you exactly. know the other, this other stuff is not their job yeah and yeah. it's getting a lot of people into trouble. Obviously, a lot of parents are... I wish more parents were waking up to it, but a lot more parents than before have woken up to some of the problems and are either taking their kids out of public schools or moving districts to better districts. Yeah. Um, and that needs to continue to happen. We're, yeah. we're seeing you know? that in the population here in North Idaho. Oh, absolutely. People are moving in here by the droves. Well, and you, know, you have uh, charter schools popping up, private schools popping up that are competing you know, mm-hmm. with yeah. the public schools, and, and that's a good thing. Yeah. We're still yeah. paying for the public schools. Well, and and it, that's, yeah, <laughs> and another this, topic. if this <laughs> new initiative with the money following the student mm-hmm. kind of takes place, um, mm-hmm. then people will be able to vote with their feet a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. would be nice. And that would be really great for our state mm-hmm. to have that pass. Have a little bit of com- competition to, to build up the quality. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so going back to the uh, question, like, so one one thing that a kid and a parent could do mm-hmm. is they could talk to their school administrator, find out what the rules and the policies are mm-hmm. as far as like what is appropriate kind of conversation mm-hmm. or what is appropriate like as far as like uh, uh, outerwear as mm-hmm. far as like what you want to support, what you can and can't support. Um, and then they would be able to get a gauge as to whether there's a little bit of a bias involved there. And then if there is a bias, then call you guys and say, look, they said that we can't do this, but they're allowing this. Then right. there could be a letter written and Absolutely. you know that all that yeah. kind of could take place. But uh, ultimately, it starts with the parent becoming invested enough to go and talk to the school administrator. Right. And know what the policies state. Mm-hmm. And and it obviously, it's not only what the policy states. It's how they are, um, you know, using that policy. Right. You know, are they evenly using the policy or are they not and so that's that's important to know and to have kind of your ear to the ground at the school enforcement's the tough part right absolutely yeah Yeah. and if they are even-handed in Mm -hmm. their approach to that policy then the right thing to do would be to adhere to the policy yeah depending on what the policy says yeah if it's a constitutional policy you know if there if it's if it's legal as far as as there we're not discriminating against a certain viewpoint or not allowing something that should be allowed Mm -hmm. then yes yeah well and and i mean that so that like in the extreme case like say for instance they have a policy that says look we're not doing any kind of political advertisements we're not doing Mm -hmm. any kind of political statements in what we wear how we dress what we're doing doesn't matter which side that you're on we're just not doing that here if you go there, then and they have that policy, then uh, uh, would it be wise to pursue doing more than the policy allows because you're passionate about your particular political ideology? You could, and that is that's that is popping up, and and I and those are you know that speech is protected. I mean, depending on the specifics, of course, um, that speech could be protected speech under the Constitution. And, and that's when either the policy needs to change or the way that they're using the policy needs to change. Um, and, you know, worst case scenario, you enter a lawsuit <laughs> right, right, right. to clean it up. But ultimately, the parent has to be involved. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. You can't just send your kids to public school and then just expect everything to be fine. Right. Yeah, you got to be involved. Go to school board meetings, know the policies, know the administrators and teachers. It's really important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that that obviously. So what are some other things that Idahoans need to be thinking about? I would say we have 
some great opportunities legislatively. So, you know, for those who don't already know their legislators, get to know them. And, you know, there's some things I think coming down that are going to be potentially very positive. One um, I'll share, which is very exciting. Um, so our state senator in Coeur d'Alene, who I know Ben Taves, is uh, going to present a resolution next year to establish Traditional Family Values Month. Okay. And so nice. this oh, is... That's going to go over well. I'm predicting a Supreme <laughs> Court challenge here. Oh, there's more. So, um, <laughs> Wait, there's more. <laughs> and so this would... Est- so the time frame between Mother's Day and Father's Day, which as you know, is mostly the month of June um, to overlap Pride Month is going to be when it's established. And really, it, it's, um, it goes into a lot of statistics about how much better children do and, and adults, but especially children do when they are part of a traditional family, a biblical mm-hmm. mother, father, Proven. family, yep. right? Um, And so that is what we're trying to highlight that, you know, there's this push for having two moms is fine. Having two dads is fine. You know, even single parents, um, you know, kids struggle Mm -hmm. in various different ways Mm -hmm. because God designed us, you know, each child to have a mother and a father. And so um, that's That's going to be pretty radical. Right. Yeah, I know. (laughs) (laughs) Who knew? (laughs) Um. So that's exciting. So we're we're trying to get traction on that, um, and you know Senator Taves is really great, and I think he's going to hopefully get this across the finish line. And it would so in the state of Idaho, that would be an established month that can be celebrated. It would give people a voice um, in the midst of Pride Month to say, you know, go traditional families. You we know? need a we need a flag, and we're going to we're going to do that. <laughs> Gonna have a gonna flag. Gonna establish a flag. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You're gonna have a contest for that? We got a <laughs> we got a flagpole. So buttons. There you go. <laughs> buttons. You'll be the first Bumper to know stickers. what the flag looks like. <laughs> yeah, I would be deeply interested to know that. Uh, yeah. I think that would be great to celebrate the traditional yeah. family because yeah. statistically there's, there's no arguing that uh, it yeah. it is it is statistically much better for everyone involved. Right. Um and, and the community at large. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that the argument is is that there's not a heap of data to support the other uh the other side of that argument and which honestly is probably true because we don't have a lot of time where we have been able to do a lot of research on the length of time for same-sex families or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Um but I don't I don't anticipate that that's going to change very much because like you said you know god created it a certain way right um and it works best in that way right and i think that that's probably not going to change it might be an anomaly probably Mm -hmm. where a person does really well but that's probably going to come from um homosexual couples that are not confused about their gender ideology Mm-hmm. Um, they'll mm-hmm. probably just be homosexual couples that are homosexual. Yeah. You know? Right. Um, but, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure how you could have a house full of people with a mental disorder and then expect that the child is going to come out without any kind of mental disorder themselves. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, right. and so, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to change much, but that being said, yeah, I mean, it'd be great to have, uh, a, a you couldn't call it pride. You, traditional families. Traditional a, Family Values Month. Yeah, yeah is what we're need an officially acronym talking. Or trad yeah. Trad Month. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. You need something. Yeah. Trad you, Fam. Yeah. yeah trad <laughs> Fam. You, you got to do something because it's got to be simplified a it's little. Got to be catchy. <clears throat> yeah. And yeah, I'll work on that. You're gonna work on that, Greg. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. And we the flag. Look, we look the forward. Buttons. We look forward to that. And the bumper stickers. So that's exciting. So yeah. any, anything else that we can be looking out for, or that we need to be thinking about? Other. Well, let me. Let me I, what can we do? To that's help the end of the my, podcast, Greg. Oh, it on. is. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> can you quit? I always get in trouble for you know, grief, going to the man. end too early. But hey, I already asked. It. You're so, <laughs> it's so it's so irritating. You're fired. But, it, just for this, you're hired again, thing. but you're you're fired. Okay, yeah. thank you, appreciate. That. I love being hired, <laughs> fired, and fired and hired. Well, it gives you a sense of security. It does. Yeah. 
No, we would we would love for you to get the word out about it. You yeah. know, so um, another local parent helped draft this, Conrad Woodall um, and myself, and then Senator Taves have kind of put this together, and we're just really trying to get the word out um, about it. At, at some point, we're going to have a, a website, you know, specific mm-hmm. to this. Um, it's not ready at this time. Um, but, yeah, come January, when the legislative session starts again, um, we would love to get as much traction on this. So letting your congregation know, anyone in the community that you know about it would be fantastic. If you guys get a promotional packet together, make sure we get it. So okay. We can, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll be glad to do Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so what else are we looking at in North Idaho? What else should Idahoans be looking at? I think similar to what we already talked about. So, you know, free speech <coughs> issues, freedom of re- free exercise of religion, especially right. in the workplace. That's a that's a major one, mm-hmm. um, obviously in schools as well. Um, you know, I think here's another thing happening. This is more statewide, but obviously it affects us as well. You know, a lot of the good laws that we are passing are being challenged by, you know, the ACLU and other right. similar right. entities Um, so keep an eye on that, you know, and you're talking about the abortion law, HB 71. That's an example. Yeah. That's an example. The, the bathroom law that was just passed for schools, you know, so biological males have to use men's restroom, biological Mm -hmm. females, female restroom, no exceptions. So do you think there's any, any will for that to become not just a school Regulation definitely just be all public places. Definitely, Kinda I like think the smoking law became absolutely. I think um, the crisis area of that was in public schools, and so mm-hmm. they went after that first. Um, that is that's been challenged. Well, you had those two young ladies in Coeur d'Alene, yes, that uh, mm-hmm. were challenging their school board because they had a young man in their absolutely. bathroom, mm-hmm. and it was freaking them out. Yes, and uh, it's it's fascinating to me how people that are supposed to be supportive of all people's rights, right? Mm -hmm. Especially women's rights and things like that. It's so interesting to me how in the desire to elevate trans rights, Mm -hmm. women's rights are just being trampled over. You're right. I just don't understand how they can't see that. I'm not sure that's it's like don't see it. They just don't care at the moment. I think I think this one group is the group right now. You know, everything is focused on on LGBTQ dot 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 um, you know agenda. Right. I mean, this is the big agenda all over the country, including in our our little community here. Um, and so I would I'm not sure that it's it's not that they don't see it. It's that that's it's a brainwashing. Agenda. So it's like collateral damage. Yeah, and and Willing it's just to take one for the team. <laughs> yeah, no, and wow. it's that's a it's a major major problem, and 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 from a legal standpoint, you know, they're they're trying to redefine terms, you know, that are in our statutes. You know, sex being the big one. You know, mm-hmm. obviously historically that means biological sex. Mm-hmm. They are trying to, you know, through lawsuits, change the definition for the word sex to also include gender identity sexual orientation yeah and that is where we're running into into problems we're we're hopeful we are hopeful that one of these cases will get to the supreme court and will be correctly interpreted um but it's it's a very ongoing legal battle right now well there's a battle to get rid of all the supreme court justices that would right ask that right right yeah really i mean our supreme court right now is turmoil well, but they are also coming out with a lot of great decisions. I was going to say that our Supreme are, Court now is probably more constitutional oh, than it has yeah. been yep. in a very long but time. Absolutely, <laughs> against even the and, even the girl that um, was just put on mm-hmm. uh, the Biden appointee, um, she's made some shockingly constitutional decisions. There was a there was a recent unanimous decision in a religious freedom case. Um, unanimous. Groff, ca- yeah, we we were wow. we expected it to go the way that it did, but we absolutely didn't expect it to be unanimous. Right. So that was very great. You yeah. know that was and really the Supreme Court is kind of 
standing in the line mm-hmm. to prevent a lot of further deterioration yeah, I than see we could have right now. Yeah, they're doing their job. They're, they are. They're guarding yeah. the Constitution. They really are. Okay. Should be yeah. doing. I almost hate to say this, but do you think there's an ulterior motive to passing certain ones with something others coming down the line that might not be so uh, invasive? You mean Supreme Court justices? Yeah. Well, yeah. could be. You know, I, I I have no idea. Eh, it's a possibility. Trust but no let's one. Just, let's just be Trust honest. Trust no one. Yeah. Joe Biden's not going to be brilliant enough to be able no. to do that over the course of time. You know what I mean? He doesn't yeah. have the time. He doesn't have the luxury of time no. to right. be able to do anything like that. But, you know, over a period of decades, you might be able to do that. But it takes yeah. that long, that long. Yeah. to turn the Supreme Court around. It, it really does. Mm-hmm. It takes mm-hmm. a long time. Yeah. Which is why they were wanting to stack the justices. They were wanting to just right. put, add more justices because that's that the would be easier. Yeah. But a that's easier. a bad precedence, and that's why they don't want to do it. And really, yeah. the Supreme Court has given individual states a lot of opportunity to pass state laws. You know, that we have a lot. You know, our our state especially. You know, it's it's a majority conservative state in, in our legislature is majority mm-hmm. conservative there's a lot of opportunity there yeah to pass really great you know religious freedom laws yeah. free speech laws yeah. based on what has come down from the supreme court and so i think it's really important to capitalize on that yeah and I, got, I got in trouble on a li- liberal facebook group not too long ago <laughs> because after roe v wade got demolished and states started kind of passing their own laws for abortion um Everybody in this liberal Facebook group on it, it, in Idaho um, was just raging about it and saying, "I got to move away from Idaho. This place has just got it's you know, these sentiments about mm-hmm. well, it's, it, it, we yeah. got to leave now." And and what I said was, "Is isn't it great that you live in a country where you can move thirty miles away mm-hmm. and live under different laws?" It is. Isn't that great? It is. And man alive. <laughs> oh my goodness. You should they have. They didn't like that. Oh no, 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 no. They did not like that because obviously none of them have the will to actually do that. Yeah. Um, but I, that's part of the magic of our system mm-hmm. is that if you don't like the laws that you're living under, move. you can move to a neighboring state if you're right. willing to do that. Right. Pay the price. Right. Then you know you can you can live under completely different laws, mm-hmm. um, and I I'm so thankful that we have a Supreme Court that's actually giving the states the ability to be sovereign. Yes, agreed. <coughs> yeah. which is constitutional. Yeah, which is constitutional. <laughs> right. the way it was so set it's up. not a complicated <coughs> thing. It's exactly how it was supposed to be. Yeah, and we're finally getting back to that. So th- there are a lot of challenges that we face coming up with some of the laws that we have passed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, many of them have been challenged. Um, the one I, the one I mentioned, the other one is, um, you know, we in Idaho, if no one knows this, you know, banned all gender changing care for yep. minors. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, so that has also been challenged. Interestingly enough, um, partially on parental rights grounds. So suddenly the left is concerned about parental rights, mm-hmm. saying that the parents of those children who want to take hormones and who knows what else, um, chop off body parts mm-hmm. and, and all of that, you know, the parents should have the right to Still make those medical the decisions. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> Shocker. Yeah. That's going to be complicated. Yeah. But, you know, when it comes to um, school issues, you know, they don't want the parents really to have any rights and the yeah. teachers, administrators – should be able to do whatever yeah. they want. When with you those put kids. your kid in public <laughs> school, you kind of yeah. sign over your parental yeah. rights, as it were. So I thought that was very hypocritical, but yeah, that's being challenged as well. Wow, there's nothing hypocritical about the liberal left, <laughs> is there? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's obviously a challenge for us in the future. So, th- so what are some uh, national things that that we need to be thinking about? I I don't know if this is on on. I'm sure you guys have thought about this, but obviously. The Fed had a uh, a hearing here recently where they were talking about how they're testing uh, digital currency. Mm-hmm. Uh, and along with that digital currency will come economic social governance, ESG scores. Mm-hmm. Um, is there a movement in legal circles to start drafting some ideas on how you work around that system? Because, like, say, for instance... You know, I'm working and and uh, I'm a truck driver, 
in Canada or whatever, you know, and, and, and I decide that what they're doing isn't right with COVID and I decide to protest and then you decide to freeze up my bank account mm-hmm. um, because I have digital currency. Mm-hmm. Uh, if that were to happen in America, is there legal protection for something like that? Absolutely. Constitutionally, there is. I would like to think there would be a whole lot of constitutional challenges to that. Um, you know, would our group specifically take that on? I don't know. But in generally speaking, yeah, those are, you know, depending on exactly how that shakes out, obviously we don't know yet. Right, right. But definitely there are, there are federal constitutional protections. Yeah, we're going to be having a larger good. conversation about digital currency here coming up. We have an a economist coming on. And oh, good. Yeah, what mm-hmm. was his name again? Jonathan Barth. Jonathan mm-hmm. Barth. Arizona yeah, State that's University. Right. That's right. Mm-hmm. We had him on here before, and, and mm-hmm. we talked about inflation a little bit. We'll probably talk about that again, too. Is he coming in person this time? No, it'll be another, no, it'll be another Zoom meeting, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so that that's obviously a, a thing that, that is a concern for people that are mm-hmm. following it. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. if you start handing out personal ESG scores, mm-hmm. you know, the reason why a lot of these pe- people are wondering, you know, why is it that, like companies like Disney are willing to continue to watch their bottom line dissolve right. to support these political agendas. Oops. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's ABBA time. All right. <laughs> I hit the, I hit the space bar one too many times. Um, it, the reason a lot of that is, is because of these ESG scores. They have to honor that ESG score and keep mm-hmm. it up. And if you do not do certain things, then you don't get a certain amount of ESG score. And there are a lot of banks that follow that. And if you're a business that does a lot of, of financial business like Disney does, yeah. you need those banks to help. Yeah. Um, so, you know, imagine that on a smaller, on a macro scale with each individual. You mm-hmm. know, you want to go get a loan and for a house. And they right. say, well, you know, you support Second Amendment rights a little bit too much. So we think until you get that straightened out, you, you, we're going we're gonna to say no. Right. Not yeah. only that, we're going to freeze your assets in the meantime. They could, Possibly. you know. I mean, I, well, you know, we kind of had that happen with. Uh, we had a gentleman here that is had a company that made bullets, not the whole bullet, just the lead part, and uh, he went to his bank one day and they basically shut him down. Said we're not going to allow you wow. to use our bank to, you know, do your finances through. So he had to change banks. Yeah. Wow. You know, yeah. So it's That's it's already there. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. That was that was a number of years ago. Too. Yeah. That, that was probably five years ago. ago. Yeah. Mm. Um. Yeah. So so that's mm. coming down the pipeline. So what are some other things that, nationally speaking, we mm-hmm. should be thinking about? Like what what are some things that you found that we wanted to talk about, Ken? Well, one was the Equality Act. Yes. Um, so that is proposed legislation at the federal level that would seek to add in sexual orientation and gender identity into the federal non-discrimination laws, specifically the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So this has been proposed several times now by Congress, um, hasn't made it through yet. I think they're going to keep trying. It was just reintroduced recently, so they're trying again. Um, and and this could have very far-reaching implications. And um, I think so. So the the statute right now prevents discrimination against race, religion, sex, um, and so they want to add in these two other categories. And you know, this very similar to what we've already talked about. This would fre- threaten freedom of speech, freedom of religion in the workplace, um, where you know suddenly employees again can't say what they believe about gender identity and a man is a man, a woman is a woman. Um, and it would affect, as we've also talked about, you know, the privacy of women in locker rooms, bathrooms, in sports, in, in anywhere that receives federal funding, you know, this is going to be an issue potentially for them. It's going to affect foster care, adopt adoption care. It's going to discriminate against people who say, no, if I, if I get a child, or if I want to adopt a child or foster a child and I'm not going to affirm their gender identity because mm-hmm. we are Christians, you know, they would get shoved out of being able to adopt. That's already because happening. It is already happening in other states. Mm-hmm. Yes. There are active lawsuits about that exact topic that is already, a lot of this is already happening in some states, yeah. but this would make it federal. And obviously a state like ours where 
thankfully this isn't, you know, part of our state laws and is not happening, at least to a great extent in our state, it would have a very bad effect on our state. Um, so that's just some of the ways it would affect, it affect churches. It will affect churches, you know, if a church rents out its venue for weddings, for example, they wouldn't be able to discriminate, you know, someone who is trying to have a same sex wedding at their church. So yeah, that's potentially already, very problematic. You know, that's yeah. already something that churches talk about a bit mm-hmm. and, and church attorneys talk about a lot is, yes. you know, should you even be trying to rent out your facility? And mm-hmm. it, it's so, it's, it's so shackling. Um, we've had conversations about this before in our mm-hmm. staff meetings and you, all the things that we have to be concerned about legally now, mm-hmm. it has shackled us so much mm-hmm. that it's difficult to serve your community right. in a compassionate way. Right. Uh, because, you know, you can't, you, you can't help, you can't allow the community to use the facility. Right. Because if you allow one group to use the facility and then you discriminate against another group using the facility, then all of a sudden you find yourself in a lawsuit, frivolous or not. Yeah. Um, and fortunately, churches have if attorneys that w- are willing to do that pro bono. But, yeah. you know, still you got court fees and then you got, yeah. you know, if you if you end up having to settle. I mean, it's, it's just a re- it's it's just obnoxious. It is. And um, this would make it a lot worse. Yeah, a lot worse. And it would really boil down to end end up being like the cake baker guy going to the Supreme Court. Exactly. Because yeah. it would be a constitutional battle. You'd have yeah. two constitutional amendments that would be a- actually Opposed contradicting one other, another. Yeah. Exactly. And I and I think ultimately again with our current Supreme Court, we would have um, a lot of good result from that. But I mean that takes years and years and years. Yeah. You know, to get it there you know, and have success there. And that's definitely nothing a church or really any, you know, any organization wants to go through. Or can afford. Or can afford. Exactly. Uh, Very expensive. One of the things we talk about a lot, though, with some of our state legislatures is that it it seems almost (laughs) pointless to try and change anything at the federal level. Because once things start going through at a federal level and, you know, I mean, it's... Yeah, you can call your senators, you can call your house reps, and, mm-hmm. you know, you can make your voice known, I, I suppose. But mm-hmm. ultimately speaking, um, that thing is driven by so much bureaucracy and so much stuff that's happening behind the scenes. Money. Money, Money. yeah. Y- you'd be shocked how much of our political system is driven by how much money you raise. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, yeah. you can't even show up to some debates Mm-hmm. Unless you've raised a certain amount of money, that's a question yeah. that's happening right now with Trump and DeSantis. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. well, how much money has been raised? Yeah. You know, can you actually be a part of that debate? And I'm not sure how we got to that point, but in a system yeah. like that that's driven by greed, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like the healthcare system. Where do you even start? Exactly. I agree. And honestly, that's what I tell most people is get involved locally. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to be Mm -hmm. secure your locality as much as you possibly can and then secure your state if you can. Depends on what state you live in, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, There's some states that are probably as lost as the federal government right now. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, we're not one of them. Um, I think we can do make a lot of improvements here in Idaho. Um, But I agree with you. I think it's. You know, related specifically to the Equality Act, I you know I would like to think the current House would not pass this, but I also think they're going to keep trying until it gets through. How's that, you know, how, how does that make you feel, <laughs> considering <laughs> your position and what you're fighting for? Uh, is it like throw your hands up in the air or just dig with the your federal heels government? In? Yeah. Um. Well, and, you know, a lot of our our law, our litigation is in federal court, you know, so we're dealing with the federal issues. So we can't um, ignore them. Mm -hmm. But I think we just kind of beeline, think about the Supreme Court and say Uh, they're saving us. Are you talking about Pacific? Are you talking about people? in Anyone doing this type of work. Yeah, I think it's the legal community at large involved in these issues um, says, okay, if we get the right case to the Supreme Court right now, I think they're going to interpret correctly. And that's that's yeah. what we have to believe. So that's... So we want to push for that. want to get 
with this particular Supreme Court, we want to get some of these uh, legislations that we're trying to bring forward in as quickly as possible. It's, it's, it's kind of a and weird scenario, isn't it? Because it, dealing with the federal, dealing with federal issues, it's a lot easier to get it to the Supreme Court. It's almost like a fast track to get it to the Supreme Court, as opposed to like a state legislation. You kind of have to go through a lot of places in order to get to the Supreme Court, right? Because you'd have to go through the Ninth Circuit Court before Mm -hmm. you'd be able to get to the Supreme Court, right? Yeah, so there's two paths to get a case potentially to the Supreme Court. So if you file a federal case in federal court, so federal court in Idaho, okay, that court makes a determination. (laughs) If it's uh, not what you want, you appeal to the Ninth Circuit as you said, and mm-hmm. depending on what the Ninth Circuit says, then you can appeal to the Supreme Court. So, so that's at least three layers. Says, right. And, you know, the reality is the Supreme Court takes 1% of cases that, <laughs> yeah. that, are, that you know, that so they're not even to obligated there. to take the appeal. That's correct. Yeah. And so from our standpoint, the more cases we can kind of get in the wheel cog, the more chance that they, the Supreme Court will take a case like this, you know. And the other thing that determines you know whether the Supreme Court takes cases is when the different circuits are have different decisions. So if the Ninth Circuit says this and the Second Circuit says something completely the opposite, generally that's a good time to try to get it to the Supreme Court so they can clarify for yeah. all of the circuits, hey, this no, this is what we need to do. Um, at the state level, so if you file a state-based case, you have to go through state court, state appeals court, state Supreme Court, and then potentially U.S. Supreme Court. Um, but again, very, very difficult to get a case all the way up there Yeah, yeah. doing that. So again, a lot of our, uh, some of our cases are state-based. A lot of them are federal. And so we go through the federal court, whatever circuit we're in. Obviously, we're in the Ninth Circuit here. And, you know, we'll, we'll take them as far as, we'll take them as far mm-hmm. as we can. Yeah. You know, they're a little off topic, which is my MO. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of organizations out there similar to yours. Do you, how mm-hmm. closely do you work with some of who mentioned ACLJ or mm-hmm. we haven't mentioned them. We mm-hmm. mentioned uh, CLA and, and ADF. Mm-hmm. Do you work closely with them or to get some of these cases moved up the ladder? We're definitely friendly, you know, with those, with those groups. Um, again, I, you know, we all have a, a slightly different philosophy, I would say, as mm-hmm. far as the c- types of cases we try to take so that, sometimes distinguishes things like ADF again, they're Mm -hmm. fabulous, you know, but they specifically try to find the cases that they think will get to the Supreme court, which again, that's important, you know, as we already talked about, that's a great, that's great. Um, We want to make sure everyone gets help, even if it's a tiny case that isn't necessarily Mm -hmm. going to go that high and we're more focused locally. Um, Other groups are kind of somewhere in between that. Um, and so that's great. I mean, I think we need, we desperately need, even though, like you said, there's a number of groups, we need more. So each of you fills in a gap that's there. I think so. Yeah. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all at the end of the day on the same team, right? You know, (laughs) trying to get the same things done. Yeah. Yeah. Different avenues, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we, we definitely respect the other groups and, um, do communicate sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. when, you know, about, about cases, about right. topics. Um, well, somebody like ACLJ, you know, mm-hmm. taking the Baker, as he had mentioned, all the way to the Supreme Court, that poor guy's still getting lambasted. Yeah. Um, the, it, can you help? I mean, how could you help in a situation like that? It's already got representation, so what yeah. are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying, you know, any way to band together. Yeah. I mean, we all, um, I think a lot of it is awareness too. So we, even, even if it's not our case, Mm -hmm. you know, we're not representing somebody, we, um, communicate, you know, to everyone who may follow us, Hey, this is a case going on. You need to be aware Mm -hmm. of it. This, this is what the facts were. Um, this is what, you know, the employer Mm -hmm. did or the school did or whatever it may be. Um, and you need to be aware of that. And I think that is, you know, you get enough people, um, aware, hopefully mm-hmm. upset about it. Um, <laughs> praying about it. Pray, exactly. Praying yeah. about it. I think awareness with all these issues, awareness is a big, big thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that's one yeah. way I do think all the groups do work together is generally speaking, whether it's our case or not, 
we, you know, do a rundown of, hey, this is what's happening. If the Supreme Court has ruled on it, obviously we review that yeah, with right, people so right. they know exactly where things stand. Uh, mm-hmm. We recently, you know, our group recently did that with several cases. None of them were ours, you know, mm-hmm. the Supreme Court ruled on. But this is how those cases affect religious freedom, parental rights, mm-hmm. free speech, whatever it may be. And so, so it's not necessarily the working with them, it's the results of what well, they have come yeah, up with. Yeah, which help our cases and help yeah. the people we serve and, you know. That's great. Yeah. I think the one area that is important to remember, though, about what you guys do, Pacific Justice Institute, as opposed to ADF, LC, uh, or CLA, CLA mm-hmm. uh, ACLJ, ACLJ. I don't know. How many acronyms do we need? <laughs> um, but wait, there's more. Uh, you know, as a person who has contacted all of those. Mm-hmm. Um, typically, ADF, ACLJ, um, and CLA, what they don't have is they don't have a person that is familiar with your local right. laws. Local right. representation. Um, and so right. one of the things that they will always say, you know, if they're, they're going to try and give you the most sound advice that they can, mm-hmm. particularly with church stuff, mm-hmm. um, but then they're always going to say you should contact a local attorney, mm-hmm. and we might have some people that we know that we can con- connect you to. Yeah. But there's not really, you can't, there, it's not like you call them because you're having an issue with your school system. Yeah. You know, they're going to give you some real basic kind of general knowledge, mm-hmm. but they're not going to be able to say, well, this is what Idaho statute says. Right. Uh, right. Or this is what your county statute. Good is. luck. You know, and that's yeah. it. You know, right. they and they'll help you out along. I mean, yeah. we've had instances where the CLA has written letters mm-hmm. to our school districts before. That's been mm-hmm. something that happened um, here not too long ago. A, a kid was getting a little bit of harassment about uh I don't know. I think it was their Bible. Um, they were having mm, their Bible and they had yeah. a teacher that was giving them a hard time about their Bible. Yeah. Can't do that. Um, and so we contacted the CLA and the mm-hmm. CLA wrote a letter Good. to the school. Yep. And then that was quickly resolved. Right. And once they got the letter, the school was just like, well, okay, we're done. <laughs> That's you a know. pretty clear Oops. area of the law. Yeah. yeah. They can't do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, they, they're definitely there, but it's, it's really interesting and, helpful to have people in your community Mm -hmm. right that know specifically and even know some of the school districts and how to negotiate in some of those school districts and that's our goal is to get to know the community the state at large um yeah i mean if you're here in athel idaho do you want you know an attorney in new york you know (laughs) exactly (laughs) exactly probably not if there's another option you know (laughs) and most of them are (laughs) <laughs> on the east coast unfortunately mm-hmm. um and so uh so uh the um where where do you where do you see the the cuz we have do have the some things that are going right to the supreme court right or is the idaho abortion law going to the supreme court is that the one that's going to the supreme court yeah, and then there's the other ones we mentioned are still at the lower federal level. So, okay, so Idaho kind of federal court working um, through. Ultimately, they very well could head to the Supreme Court, but not. I mean, it'll be years from now. Do they you, just started because <laughs> there you, are laws that just passed. Do you have you read the the wording of that bill, the the abortion bill mm-hmm. as, as it was put forward? <clears throat> Where do you feel like the language is at on that? Do you feel like the language is is pretty solid on that? On that bill? I do. Yeah. Okay. I do. And really most, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with a lot of the stuff we've been passing. You know, again, obviously the other side is obviously not. Um, I do. There can always be improvements, of course, right. you know, to language and bills. Um, but overall, I'm very happy with, you know, what Idaho has put out. And I, I do think um, – they're solid. If again, if we were to get in front of the Supreme Court, I do think they're solid, and I think they mm-hmm. will be upheld. Yeah, it may but just take a long time. Obvious, <laughs> obviously, we are not proponents of abortion in any way, shape, or form here. But do you think that for those of our listeners that might be a little bit more liberal leaning, mm-hmm. um, do you think that there are sufficient protections in there for mothers that are at risk of losing their lives with uh, an abortion? Absolutely. Yeah. And this goes back to, this is, a, you know, not with an abortion. Let me, let me restate that. N- yeah. Not with an abortion, but in, in, in the case where they might need an abortion to save their lives. Absolutely. And really, I wouldn't even define that as an abortion. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's an unfortunate 
you know, occurrence, obviously, but I think, you know, that's, that's more of a miscarriage type situation, Mm -hmm. you know, an abortion is an intentional situation. Yeah, you're, it's, it's derived from the word aborticide. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I do, yeah. So I do think that that is solid. That should not be a problem. Um, yeah, there's a lot of narrative out there, of course, Mm -hmm. um, that, that it's going to threaten, all of women's health, you know, <laughs> people, people, on people the, say that yeah, <laughs> so. people that are uh, of a li- left left leaning liberal mindset are convinced that that if you mm-hmm. have, say, for instance, an ectopic mer- uh, pregnancy, mm-hmm. that there's a chance that you could face legal ramifications if you ended up um, aborting. aborting that pregnancy. Yeah. And, and an ectopic pregnancy is a completely unviable situation. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not really an abortion at all yeah so do you think it's valid that a lot of these people who are uh kind of a a, a abortion it's not really the gynecologists that are leaving what's the name of that specialty group that deals with um at risk pregnancies there's a there's a specific name for that type of of medical professional and i can't remember what it is but those types of medical professionals are are leaving idaho right um i've heard that yeah, it, I mean, is is that because of the narrative? Is it because they haven't read, read the law? Or is there really a legitimate concern for them that they are might face, face legal ramifications if they perform an abortion? I don't personally think that's a legitimate concern based on the language in, in the law at all. Right. Um, is that, I mean, at, at, you know, they're... Again, my opinion, um, I think they're scrambling because, you know, this has this issue has changed very rapidly, very, you know, over the last year, you know. Right. And something they thought was solid and would be that way forever has very quickly changed. And so I think they're grasping at straws to try to maintain the narrative that, you know, anti-abortion laws are evil and they're going to kill women and they're going to, you know, cause what else can they say at this point? Yeah. Right. Um, so I don't personally think there's a legitimate concern, you know, what they're saying that, you know, they're going to get sued, they're going to get prosecuted, et cetera, um, for providing standard care in yeah. an emergency situation. Yeah. Your intention is to save the life of the mother. Yes. Then mm-hmm. what other concern would there be? Right. right. I right. mean, s- terrible things happen. You they know? do. So, yes. Um, we were uh, we were talking about this with Heather and, and we had, uh, were having this conversation about it, it seems like our legislature has tried to compromise on this issue mm-hmm. and it's just never enough. If it's anything short of just wholesale, relentless uh, abortion, uh, for convenience sake, Mm -hmm. anything less than that is just not a compromise to them at all, which means that there is no compromise. Right. You know, so I'm not sure if there is even any point in bringing this thing to the table to discuss it anymore. Um, it seems like a dead issue to me because there's never going to be a consensus, um, between the, the two sides. I mean, well, and I think, you know, since the Dobbs decision, there's, you, you see the, for lack of a better term, the radicalization of it. You know, you've got states like ours, you know, trying to really rid abortion entirely. And you've got other states that say, that are passing constitutional amendments, you know, f- you know, saying there's a right to abortion. Um, there, they have clinics opening where, you know, late term abortions, you know, are allowed up to 40 weeks, sometimes even after the baby is born. We've got Gosh, states passing mm-hmm. laws like yeah. that in this country, um, which is, I, I can't imagine even, you know, any type of centrist thinking that's okay. But, you know, so again, I think we've lost anything in the middle since Dobbs. It is, it has been very much yeah. radicalized. Yeah. Depending on where you live. Yeah, it's kind of it's it's kind of eliminated the middle ground on that. Yes, <clears throat> and that's proven by the fact that I think the Idaho bill definitely does try to draw a compromise for the whole life of the mother issue. Right. Right. Um, the only thing that it's it definitely is 
eliminating is convenience based abortion. Right. Um, right. And and so you know that's kind of the issue though, right? It's it, it's it's not really about you know it's not really about the mother as in as much as it is about we want the ability to kill our children whenever we desire to. Right. No matter how and <clears throat> no matter how many weeks you are, mm-hmm. I mean, forty week babies, you know. Yeah, that's, just the thought of that is that's brutal, you know. Yeah, well, if you if consider the fact kid, that there's <laughs> only fifty two weeks in a year, that's like almost full term. It is, yeah, no, yeah. And, and yeah, it's it is full um, term. Mm-hmm. Forty weeks, yeah, no, very much full term, very <laughs> much, very <laughs> much. That child would absolutely survive. Yeah, and, you know, and now, even I mean. Even much farther back from, you know, 20, early 20 weeks, babies are surviving now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's crazy what some of the states are doing and allowing and actually codifying in their mm-hmm. state. Do you think yeah. there's any uh, any merit to, isn't it Raul Alpador's being sued now because he uh, supported Israel 71 and now like Washington State is suing him. Because of the abortion tourism <laughs> fad that is now oh my popping goodness. up. Is we could have mer- Seriously? A, a whole podcast on this issue. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like that's a tough one to. This is another area where, you know, open. states are radicalizing in different directions. So, uh, yeah, so Idaho passed a law forbidding, you know, gender affirming care for minors. Mm-hmm. And then simultaneously, Washington passes a bill saying that. Okay, if you are coming from out of state, you can come to our state. We will temporarily take custody of you. Um, and so you can get your gender affirming care here. This is happening in other states as well, but obviously we're on the border. Um, so it affects where we live a lot. Um, and basically Washington is saying, well, we're not going to honor the, the, the laws of Idaho at all. You know, And if you're an Idaho resident, we don't care. Fair enough. Which is, you know, unconstitutional. And so I think there's going to be a lot of tit for, you know, related to Raul, I think there's going to probably be a lot of tit for tat related to that with the state of Washington. Maybe Oregon will be next as well because well, they're passing similar laws. Does, does that seem to be, how do I say this without sounding like a leftist? Um, <laughs> is, that a, for is that a little bit of an overreach? For the Idaho legislature, then, to pass a law that effectively affects another state? Well, Idaho didn't. Washington did. So Washington is saying, we don't care what, you know, if you're from Idaho. For example, you know, a kid, you got a, a runaway kid who's an mm-hmm. Idaho resident. Okay. Um, they run away to Washington. Washington will not honor the laws of where that child is from. Okay. Okay. That's the problem. So that's the problem we're having. I mean, and and yeah, that's a constitutional problem. Okay, absolutely. So so does that mean I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate here for a second? Uh huh. Um, does that mean that that we are in the wrong for not honoring their legalization of pot? Yeah, that's where I was going to go to. I was like, what? No, I mean we're <clears throat> controlling our we're controlling our state and our citizens, right? right? And. They are trying to control not only their state and their citizens, but any citizens of other states coming in. Mm-hmm. And, and they're not going to cooperate right. with law enforcement, you know, the parents of a child, for example. But, but if, a, if a parent or a child or whatever the case may be, and I would say that if you have a child that's gotten pregnant and then is not willing to talk to you about it and go across the state lines uh-huh. to get an abortion, that's probably a parenting problem right off the bat. But that being said, um, are they under an obligation to honor our laws? Yes. The full faith and credit clause of the United States says that states have to cooperate with one another if if a state is dealing with a citizen of another state. Okay, so and that's, the an, laws. that's yeah. an apples and oranges conversation then because their law is for, for a pot to be legal in their state. Correct. It has no bearing on us. But that's our right. law says that you cannot take your child over state lines to have this procedure done. Can't traffic a child over, yes. And that, yeah. uh, 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 but if a parent were to do it, mm-hmm. then Idaho would have no issue with that, mm-hmm. right? So it's just mainly if you are a person who is not the child's parent, you're, but, but Washington is saying, well, 
no, we're not going to honor that. If if a school administrator grabs your kid and says, "Hey, let's go get your your testicles removed." Yep. Then the Washington would be glad to allow that. Right. And they okay. would they would I see the problem there. And mm-hmm. they are not they are telling their state law enforcement not to cooperate with Idaho state law enforcement to bring that child back. Would that, you know, that's that's what we're dealing with there. Prosecution there? If they're breaking our laws in their state? Um, no, but they're, they're, it's a constitutional issue because they're not honoring the state of Idaho with an Idaho citizen. It's kind of, it's a complex issue. Yeah, that is a really complex uh, issue. And it's, um, you know, and again, this is, this is also something that is, that is new happening in many states and it ultimately is like everything else right now going to have to get to the Supreme court for more clarity. Um, but, and think about it too, this would be, you know, it's a, it's a great lawsuit, but it's also horrible because it would have, you know, to have standing, we'd have to have someone, you know, a child, for example, uh, run away to Washington or be trafficked into Washington and have something bad happen to, you know, have standing for a lawsuit. But, um, I do think if that were to happen in that unfortunate situation, um, that's a great constitutional challenge because, Washington constitutionally is supposed to cooperate with any other state. Right. You know, and and basically they're saying don't cooperate with Idaho. You know, or any other any other state like them, you know, with a child coming in. Oh, that's really complicated because uh, it is. Like the, yeah. you know, the the marriage issue, same thing. Yep. Gay well, marriage mm-hmm. going across state lines. Right. I, married I was back. even thinking even a little bit more practical, like Idaho's concealed carry law. It's advanced concealed carry yeah. law. You know, if you have an advanced concealed carry and you issue a concealed carry license, but you go to a state that will not honor that license, are they in the same boat, not cooperating with the laws of Idaho? Mm-hmm. Or or the li- laws of the state that they're carrying That, that opens up a lot of questions It is for a me. complicated issue, yeah. yeah. Like I said, I told you we could have a full podcast on oh, that Oh, for issue. sure. And yeah. we could. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Unfortunately, okay. we only got like 15 minutes yeah, left. start <laughs> us over. Start over. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to have you back and, and talk about some of those bigger issues. But okay. it's, um, so Raul Lord Labrador is being sued. Mm-hmm. I know the leftists hate him so much. Yeah, yep. Um, and, uh, and so we'll, we'll be praying for him, but. Yeah. And the um, citizens of Idaho get to pay for that. Yeah, isn't that great? As long yeah. as it takes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Against the pockets of Washington, yeah. Western Washington in particular. Right. Pay your taxes. You know. <laughs> if we've learned anything about government, it's good at wasting stuff. Yeah. This is where the money, oh, yeah. the money issue comes in. And, you know, kind of on that, since you guys are dependent on contributions mm-hmm. to be able to represent these cases... How's that working out in Idaho? I mean, do you guys feel like you're fully funded for the amount of cases that you're carrying? Or is that an uphill thing since your your office is kind of new in Idaho? So I imagine that's a little bit of an uphill battle. It is. Um, overall, we're doing well, um, thankfully, Good. and and rapidly growing, actually, um, So, which is great because then that allows us specifically to start more offices in more states, which is the ultimate goal, right, right. to get local offices everywhere. Um so, yes, I, th- I mean, overall, we're doing well. Um, certainly, we're always looking for mm-hmm. <laughs> more help, no doubt. It, um, if, but it, it, what, it, when the support money comes in, does it go mm-hmm. to the headquarters and then they dole it out? Or can we go yes. specifically to the, the uh, it is your tr- office here in Idaho? It's It goes through headquarters. They track where it came from, you know, so mm-hmm. they'll say, okay, this came from Idaho, you know, and then they, they track that to make sure... Idaho is kind of supporting itself, okay. so to speak. Um, but yes, go, goes through our headquarters. Okay. And certain, obviously, there's you know states that are going to have more than others mm-hmm. in donation, and yeah, we cover that. So, how would a person donate to the Pacific Justice Institute? Um, visiting our website would be a great start. So pji.org, um, and you can donate there. Um, and that would be great. Yes. And it's, um, utilized in all of our offices everywhere. Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, how about Greg? You got any last thoughts? Oh man. 
You always sneak up on me. <laughs> Dude, it's not sneaking up. We've when been I'm, sitting here for like almost an hour and a half, okay? Yeah, You've had yeah. plenty of time to think about this. But every time I say something, you get mad at me. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's kind of what we do. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I'm in charge of our missions money here, and I can sit here and safely say, you know what, we're going to look at at supporting you guys, plain and simple. Thank you. Um, appreciate you coming out and, and doing this. I love the fact that you're local. Uh, we try to be as local as we can in these podcasts mm-hmm. so that the, the, our our listeners can understand what's going on. And uh, if they wanted to contact you directly, mm-hmm. would they do that through the, the main website as well? You can do that. Um, you do, know, do you want to give out your email address? Here? I can. Yeah. Sure. You want me to do that? On sure. There? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Catherine Hartley, my email address is K Hartley at PJI.org. So feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, or you can absolutely go through our main website, PJI.org, um, Mm -hmm. to request legal help. Our website also has a lot of just resources, free Mm -hmm. resources for churches, parents, um, employees, employers. Um, so feel free to check that out as well. And certainly if something doesn't make sense, reach out to me and we can go over mm-hmm. it. Um, and yeah, obviously if you have legal troubles as well, mm-hmm. um, feel free to reach out to me. All right. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> How about it, Ken? You got any last words? Well, uh, one of the scriptures that I came across when I was researching this, this topic was Psalm 10. And I can either write the, read the entire psalm it's not super long but it's it's kind of an interesting psalm if you're in one of these situations where you're you're being discriminated against wrongly from a position of your faith and wondering god are you there and are have you got my back um you guys want me to read it uh y- yeah this or is pretty th- appropriate yeah okay yeah so it's, it begins rhetorically. So this is the, the oppressed person. I don't know. Was this a Psalm of David? Do you know? I don't know specifically. I know some of the early Psalms were not. And so the psalmist says, Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursues the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have desi- devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul. And the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. Sounds a lot like what's going on in some of these cases. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there's no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high out of his sight, he would think. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. Abortion. Mm. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord, O God. Lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper to the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find no more. And then it finishes. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. Amen. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing. That is a Psalm of David, indeed. Cool. Um, before we give Catherine the final word here, um, I think my last words would be uh, in searching out the appropriate place for Christianity and opposition um and the rightness at which point it is right to act politically uh it's that's an ongoing discussion i think in a lot of congregations and you know you run the risk of being overly political 
uh, and we've seen that happen. That we've gone down that road a little bit here, um, and just didn't feel like it was God's will for us. Um, we have churches in our community that are overtly political, um, but the moral question is always: When should you be political? When? When should you step out of the kingdom in order to engage in the in in the work of this secular world? Um, and um, you know that uh, everybody has to kind of answer that question for themselves. But I think one of the places that I'm landing on with this whole issue of being involved politically is that it's always right to be involved in moral issues. And a lot of politics is moral. You have an obligation to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Um, and that's politically, philosophically, theologically. Um, you have a responsibility to be an ambassador of Christ. Which means, though, that if you are a believer and you determine that you want to be engaged politically, you want to be engaged legally, you want to be engaged in our secular culture and how it is ran, it cannot come from a place of anger and hatred and bitterness. It has to come from a place of justice and holiness and love. Um, That's an absolute essential. If you cannot approach a subject without having anger and hatred in your heart, you should probably not approach it at all. Um, And I think that's kind of the place where I'm landing at with a lot of this stuff. Uh, and you know, just me personally, it's been a big issue for me because I want to be politically involved, but it seems like there's a time and a place for everything under the heavens. Right. Mm -hmm. And when is the right time to do that? And that's, that's an ongoing discussion, but I think the centerpiece of that has to be love and justice and holiness and, um, I think even engaging in the legal system, you know, I mean, if you can't, if you can't do it without having hatred and anger in your heart, then you probably shouldn't be there in the first place because that's kind of when justice becomes blind, right? right. Or unblind. It's it, the, the, the blindfold's taken off at that point. I, it, we had talked about this before that uh, much of what Jesus did and said was with the political leaders oh yeah of his time mm-hmm. oh yeah so he yeah. was involved oh yeah he was involved in a big way but mm-hmm. even in his anger even as his righteous, yeah, righteous indignation it was not anger towards people mm-hmm. or people groups it was anger at at, at situations um and I, i'm saying policies yeah and, so that when yeah, people so he, say he oh was, don't get involved in politics yeah you know, i i don't he, see i don't feel like you can live in a world as a believer and not be involved mm-hmm. in the moral discussion i don't think that that's mm-hmm. right uh, because being an ambassador of Christ, you have to represent Christ and the gospel in every situation because you live in this world. You know, I mean, you're maybe a stranger here, but you're here nonetheless to do that job. And so I don't think you can let yourself completely off the hook. But Great. also, you have to do it with wisdom, you have to do it with love and justice and equity in mind. And, you know, that's why, like in instances with the with the transgender wanting to use the bathroom, you know, I, I think this is a definite area where Christians can get morally involved because there's an equity issue there. It is not right to take away the rights of one person to give rights to another. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that's definitely a moral issue uh, that we can speak into. And we can speak into it with love. You know, I don't have to hate a transgender person to be able to speak that truth. They may feel as though it's hate, but I don't have to have that hate in my heart. And I think that's important. That's an important distinction. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's just my last thoughts. I'm I'm not sure that that had a whole lot of bearing in everything that we talked about here, but I felt like it needed to be said. Sure. Mm -hmm. So we'll all give an account. Yeah, for sure. Catherine, do you have any last words for us? I think I would just encourage your listeners to kind of what you were saying, get involved in something, you know, whether that's learning what the issues are, um, being involved in the school setting, being involved in your workplace. Um, You know, we need Christians, you know, believers in particular to be aware of what's going on and 
to, again, as you said, with love, go into the communities and, and try to sp- and just speak the truth. And, yeah. Yeah. um, again, that looks very differently for everyone, depending on what your strengths are, um, what opportunities you may have, but make something your ministry to go out and be involved in and not put your head in the sand, I guess, right. with all of the things going on in our world right now. Um, and do it locally. I think that's where you, you can, you can make a difference locally. Um, and so no one's exempted. Everyone can do something. (laughs) And so I think, um, I just want to encourage everyone to, to be involved in some way. Yeah. Oh, you there for, amen. Amen. Well, Catherine, thanks for being with us today. We really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. I appreciate and, uh, being here. Thanks a yeah, lot. We'll definitely have to try and have you back so we can talk a little bit more about some of these specific issues and get a little bit more of a of a of a focused approach <laughs> instead of like a <laughs> shotgun approach. <laughs> um, but as far as today is concerned, that about does it for us today. As always, thank you for joining us. If you have any comments or questions, you can email Ken at three p at ethelbaptistchurch dot org. <laughs> Don't bother emailing me or Greg because we won't answer. <laughs> Um, if you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like, share it with your friends, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. It really helps us, guys, when you share these episodes, so please do that. Thanks to ABC and its members for their generous support of this ministry. And again, thank you for listening. And until next time, remember the Great Commission. Go into all the world, reach the lost with the gospel, and build disciples who can do the same. And with that, we are out.